Okay, well, thanks very much. Um, it's great to be back here in Iceland. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm going to talk about the issue of uh, human-caused climate change from uh, a slightly different perspective, from the perspective of somebody who has uh, literally been in the center of the very fractious um, and contentious public debate over human-caused climate change and what to do about it. Uh, and so I will talk uh, about my experiences at the center of this debate as a reluctant uh, public figure in the larger battle over climate change and some of the lessons uh, that I've learned over the years and how I've come to embrace uh, this role. It isn't what I signed up for when I decided to uh, double major in applied math and physics at uh, University of California, Berkeley, go off to do a PhD in theoretical physics at Yale University. Little did I know that that career path would ultimately place me at the center of, again, one of the most contentious uh, societal debates we've ever had. Uh, but it uh, has given me an opportunity at the same time to inform uh, this very important discussion over what might be indeed the greatest challenge that we have ever faced as a civilization. And I have uh, come to embrace that role. Uh, so let me start out by emphasizing, uh, as we've seen, uh, the science uh, behind human-caused climate change uh, is incontrovertible. Uh, it is the very deep and widespread consensus of the world's scientists that human-caused climate change uh, is real and it's caused by human activity, and it's already a problem for us. Uh, whether it's drought or uh, wildfires, epic floods, the erosion of our coastlines, the literal acidification of our oceans, combining with the bleaching of coral reefs from record warm ocean temperatures, Record strength hurricanes just earlier this year, um, the, the strongest hurricane we've ever seen. Uh, and I don't think that's a coincidence. The worst drought in at least 1,200 years in California. Uh, once again, I don't think that's a coincidence. And by the way, let me do that again. Uh, many of us hoped that this major El Nino event, which typically brings rainfall uh, and, and an increased snowpack in the mountains of California would help take California out of this epic ongoing drought. Uh, a major El Nino event, uh, by some measure, the strongest El Nino that we've seen, and yet, as we see here, did very little to change the picture. We're already into the dry season in California, and there's still an extreme drought. Again, the worst in at least 1,200 years. And of course, as I like to point out, the governor of California who's taken such an active role in uh, publicizing the impacts that climate change is having on California and the rest of the world and has really devoted um, his uh, governorship to uh, acting on climate change. Uh, well, as you can see in the corner there, he knows where to get his climate science. Wildfire, as I mentioned, epic wildfire uh, right now um, in uh, Saskatchewan. Uh, we've seen uh, the worst wildfire on record uh, following uh, several uh, extremely warm years. So as we've seen, the impacts of climate change, uh, not only are they evident, they are becoming uh, increasingly widespread, increasingly profound. Uh, the problem is clear. Uh, and so why is it that we haven't yet taken meaningful action uh, to deal with this problem at a global scale? Well, to understand that, of course, we have to leave the domain of science and enter into the domain of policy and politics. And we can't ignore the fact that the single most powerful industry that this planet has ever known, the fossil fuel industry, um, has a stake in seeing that we remain addicted. Uh, to quote uh, former President uh, uh, George uh, W. Bush, who talked of our addiction to fossil fuels, um, there is an industry, a powerful industry, a vested interest, the fossil fuel industry, that wants to see us stay addicted to fossil fuels. They're profiting greatly from that. And they've made no secret of it, or at least they accidentally 
um, have revealed uh, their intentions. Uh, in a memo that was leaked uh, a decade and a half ago um, in the United States, uh, revealed a confidential discussion involving a, a famous Republican uh, pollster, a conservative uh, pollster in the US, Frank Luntz. And uh, this is a memo where he was advising his clients, uh, essentially the Republican Party, or essentially the fossil fuel industry, that there was a closing window of opportunity, that the American people, in particular, were becoming convinced that climate change is real, that humans are changing the climate, that is having uh, a negative impact on us. And if they were led to believe that we are responsible for the warming of our planet and the changes in climate, they would demand policy action of their policymakers, of their politicians. But what his polling and his focus groups and his research indicated was that there was still a narrow window of opportunity left to infuse uncertainty and controversy and confusion into the larger public discourse over human-caused climate change. And it is because of that strategy, which uh, uh, has been pursued uh, by many, in particular, uh, of the Republican persuasion of conservatives in the US, um, that have uh, made that uh, a policy um, and have uh, funded uh, think tanks and organizations and individuals uh, to manufacture apparent controversy, to convince the public that there is no scientific consensus behind human-caused climate change. There's a wonderful book uh, about this, the, the Merchants of Doubt, uh, by uh, Naomi Oreskes and Eric Conway, which explains how the modern campaign to deny human-caused climate change has in its roots previous disinformation campaigns, industry-funded disinformation campaigns, such as the tobacco industry's campaign decades ago to convince the public and policymakers that there was no relationship between their product, tobacco products, cigarettes, and human health ailments like lung cancer, people who are dying of, uh, of the effects uh, of uh, using these tobacco products. They were denying that there was any problem with their product. Well. It might not surprise you to learn that the same organizations, the same front groups, in fact, some of the same scientist advocates who served as paid advocates for the tobacco industry decades ago, attacking the science linking tobacco products and human health, attacking the work of their fellow scientists in return for getting paid large sums of money from the tobacco industry, some of those same individuals today are working for the fossil fuel industry, denying the science linking their product, fossil fuels, and the burning of fossil fuels to the health not of individuals, but of our entire planet. So we have senators, um, powerful politicians in the United States. You may have uh, heard of Senator James Inhofe, uh, otherwise known as uh, Senator Snowball. Uh, a couple years ago, he walked out onto the Senate floor. It was in the middle of the winter, and he introduced a snowball as evidence that climate change can't be real because it snowed in Washington, DC in the winter. <laughs> well, it turns out that James Inhofe has declared that climate change is the single greatest hoax ever perpetrated on the American people. Um, and uh, I uh, take that as a great compliment that uh, I and my fellow scientists have been able to uh, convince the entire scientific community uh, of this hoax. And we've been able to get the ice sheets and sea levels and polar bears to play along with this hoax. We have more influence than we even realized. Well, James Inhofe uh, was actually invited to be the keynote speaker uh, a couple years ago. Actually, it was back in summer 2011 uh, to be the keynote speaker at the annual climate change denial conference of the Heartland Institute. The Heartland Institute is an industry-funded uh, organization that used to front for the tobacco industry in attacking uh, the, the science linking their product to, to lung cancer um, decades ago. And today, they front for the fossil fuel industry and uh, trying to undermine 
public confidence in the science behind human-caused climate change. And they wanted James Inhofe to be their keynote speaker at their annual conference. Um, and he accepted, but he had to back out at the last minute, unfortunately. He had uh, actually gotten ill swimming in a, a lake back in his home state of Oklahoma um, that was suffering from an algal bloom uh, due to the unprecedented heat and drought that Oklahoma was experiencing that summer, um, he was unable to make the, the uh, conference. Well, so there's this circus-like atmosphere when it comes uh, to uh, the contentious debate over human-caused climate change and what to do about it, uh, particularly in the United States, uh, where I come from. But we see some semblance of it uh, in other countries as well. We see some of that here in Iceland. And I found myself at the center of this circus, uh, if you like, uh, because of this graph that my co-authors and I published a decade and a half ago. Uh, it came to be known as the hockey stick because of the shape of the graph, um, where uh, it depicts uh, our estimate of temperatures going back 1,000 years. You've got this relatively warm period. We sometimes call it the medieval warm period. Um, and it was warmer than the subsequent centuries. But at the scale of the entire northern hemisphere, there's no counterpart as far back as we could go to the fairly remarkable warming we've seen over the past century. Um, and if you like, you can imagine uh, that the shape of this curve somewhat resembles the, the, uh, you know, a hockey stick, um, with the blade of that hockey stick being the abrupt warming of the past century. Now, it became an icon in the climate change debate. It became a potent symbol in the climate change debate. And as a result, it was subject to all sorts of attacks by climate change contrarians who find this graph inconvenient because it tells a simple truth. You don't have to understand the complexities of how a theoretical climate model works to understand what the graph is telling us, that there is something unprecedented taking place today in our climate. And by implication, it probably has to do with this unprecedented burning of fossil fuels. Well, to the critics, it doesn't matter that there's now a veritable hockey league which is to say there are many uh, graphs of this sort that have been constructed by different groups of scientists using different methods, different data. And they all come to the same conclusion about the recent warmth, that it's unprecedented as far back as uh, we can go, more than 1,000 years now, as uh, various groups have extended these records back in time. Well, there is a little wrinkle in the story, because just a few years ago, uh, there was a new study published um, in the prestigious journal uh, Nature Geoscience. It was the most comprehensive study of this type yet done. Uh, nearly 80 authors from uh, nearly 40 institutions around the world uh, using the most comprehensive paleoclimate database ever brought uh, to bear on reconstructing the climate. And they came up with a, a completely different uh, Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's right. They got the same answer that we had gotten 15 years ago. Um, they came to the same conclusion. Um, that does appear to be a robust conclusion. And the IPCC, the very conservative intergovernmental panel on climate change, has in fact concluded in their most recent report that the recent warmth appears to be unprecedented at least over the past 1,400 years. In fact, there's some tentative evidence that it may be unprecedented in more than 100,000 years. Um, but it doesn't matter. You could get rid of the hockey stick. You could get rid of the hockey league. You could get rid of all that paleoclimate evidence. And we have so many independent lines of evidence today that tell us that the globe is warming up, that our climate is changing, and that human activity uh, is responsible, that it wouldn't matter if the hockey stick had ever existed, if the hockey league even existed. But it has become, the hockey stick has become a lightning rod, if you'll forgive the, the mixed metaphor, um, in the climate change debate because it does convey a, a simple truth. And as a result, uh, and because of that, I have been subject to attacks. My collaborators have been subject to attacks by climate change deniers. Uh, many would refer to these um, attacks as a, an example of the politicizi uh, politicization of science. Try saying that 10 times. <laughs> Well, I think it's something different. I think it's something worse. I think what we're talking about is actually the scientization of politics. And what I mean by that is that science is now used 
as just another way of waging politics. Um, certainly in the United States, but there's evidence of that in other uh, countries as well. Um, if you don't like the science as assessed by the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, if you don't like the science as assessed by the US National Academy of Sciences, founded by a Republican president, by the way, in the 1800s, Abraham Lincoln, who you may have heard of, founded the National Academy of Science. If you don't like the conclusions of all of the academies of science, of all of the major industrial nations, or the dozens and dozens of scientific organizations and societies around the world, all of which have weighed in with the conclusion, the consensus, the overwhelming consensus that climate change is real, it's caused by human activity, it's already a problem, it's going to be a much worse problem if we don't do something about it. If you don't like that conclusion, there are entire television networks available to you, newspapers, um, and powerful politicians who are happy to portray the entire science of climate change as a global conspiracy, a hoax. And increasingly, in our modern sort of uh, media age, uh, it's very easy for people to trap themselves in a bubble where they only get information from a limited set of sources, including those sources which will happily uh, reinforce uh, this misconception, their preconceptions, their misconceptions about climate change. So we have powerful members of our Congress, like Joe Barton, who was the chair of the House Energy and Commerce Committee. And back in 2005, I got a, a message from uh, Joe Barton. Um, well, actually, it was a congressional subpoena, a, a subpoena demanding all of my personal emails from my entire scientific career based on the fact that he had read a criticism of our work, which apparently had influenced the Kyoto Protocol in 1997, although our paper wasn't published until 1998. I'm still trying to figure out how that uh, works. Well, Joe Barton um, felt you know, entitled to demand these materials because our work had been criticized in that uh, most respected of journals, uh, the editorial pages of the Wall Street Journal, um, which dominated even today by climate change deniers, owned by Rupert Murdoch, who denies uh, human-caused climate change. He felt that this was a perfectly suitable reason to demand all of my personal emails for my entire scientific career, and by the way, and all the emails with all of my scientific colleagues. Well, the scientific community in the United States didn't take kindly to what they saw as an obvious effort by uh, a congressman who, by the way, coincidence probably that he happened to be the largest recipient of fossil fuel money in the US House of Representatives. Um, they saw this as an obvious effort to intimidate scientists whose findings might be inconvenient to those who fund uh, Mr. Barton's campaigns. Uh, the American Meteorological Society, the American Geophysical Union, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, which publishes uh, Science Magazine, one of our most respected journals, uh, the journal Nature. Um, liberal Democrats like Henry Waxman uh, of California, um, who uh, helped bring the tobacco industry to justice in decades past uh, for hiding the health impacts of their product. Maybe it wouldn't, it's not that surprising that somebody, a progressive Democrat like Henry Waxman, uh, would come out to defend us against uh, attacks uh, by uh, Joe Barton. What you might find surprising was that the biggest heroes in the story turned out to be Republicans, congressional Republicans. Uh, Sherwood Bullard, who is now a good friend of mine, um, was the chair of the House Science Committee. He was a Republican as well, but he was sort of an old school, pro-science, pro-environment, uh, New England type Republican. And he used some of the harshest language of anybody in condemning what he saw basically as modern day McCarthyism. Now he wasn't the only prominent uh, Republican to do so. You might recognize this guy as well. Ran for president previous election, John McCain, who wrote an, a commentary in the Chronicle of Higher Education where he said the message sent by the Congressional Committee to the three scientists was not subtle. Publish politically unpalatable scientific results and brace yourself for political retribution. It represents a kind of intimidation which threatens the relationship between science and public policy. That behavior must not be tolerated. 
Now, for students of modern American politics in the audience, you may recognize that it's almost unprecedented in modern American political life to have such a prominent Republican publicly call out another po uh, prominent Republican in this way. And it speaks to the fact that not so long ago, even a decade ago, this was not nearly the partisan political issue that it is today. Well, I haven't said anything yet. <laughs> I heard those snickers. Well, uh, a few years later, uh, many of you will be familiar with the scandal of ClimateGate. It, again, total coincidence that in the lead up to the Copenhagen summit, which was the first opportunity for meaningful progress in years to deal with climate change, there was this sudden scandal where climate change deniers had stolen thousands of emails from a, a computer server in the UK, a university server in the UK, thousands of emails between climate scientists, including myself, and what they had done over several months, it was released just weeks before Copenhagen, but they had spent several months combing through those emails looking for individual words and phrases that they could take out of context to try to make it sound like climate change was indeed an elaborate hoax, that scientists were engaged in all matters of manipulation and fudging the data. And Sarah Palin at the time, it was uh, widespread in the conservative uh, news in the US. And in fact, it even reached into the mainstream news uh, in the United States, uh, here in Europe as well, this pseudo scandal of climate gate. Um, and at the time, as Copenhagen was just getting underway, Sarah Palin wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post where, oops, she said that the emails reveal that leading climate experts deliberately destroyed records, manipulated data to hide the decline in global temperatures. Well, it's a very interesting claim because the email she was referring to is an email I was actually a recipient of. It was written in early 1999 on the heels of the warmest year we had ever seen. 1998 was the warmest year we had seen at that point. There was no decline in global temperatures uh, to be talked about. What the scientists were talking about was a graph that they had constructed uh, using data that was known to be unreliable after 1960. And so what they talked about in the email was not showing the misleading data after 1960. In fact, they had written an article in the journal Nature a year earlier talking about why these data are unreliable after 1960. So they were talking about not showing the bad data that would mislead people who are reading this government report. And I explained that in some of the other things that Sarah Palin had gotten wrong in my own op-ed in the Washington Post nine days later. And it appears to have even convinced Sarah Palin, okay, because I'm going to read you, these are her words. A few years later, she admitted a lot of those emails obviously weren't meant for public consumption. And she said they could be misinterpreted if they were taken out of context. Now, she, of course, was referring to her own emails that had been released uh, in response to a Freedom of Information Act request from her time as governor of Alaska. No end of hypocrisy when it comes to the denial of human-caused climate change. And James uh, Inhofe, who you'll remember uh, from uh, earlier, uh, was convinced that these stolen emails were grounds to prosecute 17 climate scientists in the US. Um, uh, I'm proud to say I was one of those 17, along with the Presidential Medal of Science winner Susan Solomon of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology uh, and also the chair, previous chair of the IPCC. Well, it didn't stop there. The attacks continued. Despite the fact that uh, now, you know, several years later, there have been nine different investigations in the US and the UK, every one of them has found that there was no evidence of impropriety on the part of the scientists. Um, this was just a matter of their words being taken out of context and then being misrepresented. In fact, the only wrongdoing, the only crime was the criminal theft of those emails in the first place. But that didn't matter. Those investigations took years to play out. And in the meantime, Republicans in the US uh, exploited this pseudo uh, scandal uh, for maximum effect. Uh, Ken Cuccinelli, uh, was the newly minted Attorney General of Virginia. Um, and in the months uh, after uh, the emails uh, were released, um, as the new Attorney General of Virginia, uh, 
He might be called a Tea Party Republican, a very conservative Republican. In his first act as Attorney General, he, um, oh, wait a second, that, that's right, sorry. Yeah. His first act as Attorney General, he wanted to, to change the official state seal of Virginia because it exposed part of the anatomy of the Roman goddess Virtus that he didn't think should be exposed. He just didn't think it was family friendly. He wanted a family friendly, uh, um, uh, well, it, it was actually his second act as Attorney General was to take a page from the Joe Barton playbook and use his authority as Attorney General to issue a civil subpoena demanding, guess what? All of my personal emails from the time I was at the University of Virginia. Now, once again, uh, uh, his uh, subpoena, his actions didn't uh, get too much support from the scientific community. Um, the, U the Union of Concerned Scientists immediately spoke out. Um, the ACLU, the AAUP, the, the conservative group, uh, fire that advocates against uh, academic freedom, and they typically advocate for conservative causes, but they came out, they said, it doesn't matter what your politics are. The idea that an attorney general could go after an academic because he or she doesn't like their ideas, that's dangerous regardless of whether you're a progressive or conservative, and they didn't want to see any part of that. Uh, there was a petition of 800 scientists from the state of Virginia, and I will confess I didn't realize there were 800 scientists in the state of Virginia, um, uh, condemning what they saw as an obvious attempt, once again, to intimidate a scientist whose findings might be inconvenient to the special interests that fund Mr. Cuccinelli's campaigns, the AAAS, once again, the American Meteorological Society, the journal Nature, all once again weighed in against what they saw as an obvious uh, and very dangerous assault on science. The Washington Post published no less than five editorials denouncing uh, what they characterized as Ken Cuccinelli's witch hunt against me and the University of Virginia. And their award-winning uh, cartoonist Tom Tolles couldn't resist commenting on the matter, not once, but twice. And I have to confess, this is my favorite. <laughs> That's poor Galileo down there, and there's Cuccinelli in the judge's chair, and he wants his emails as well. Um, I don't mind being compared to Galileo, I will confess. <laughs> well, I'll have more to say um, about my latest project with Tom Tolles. But Ken Cuccinelli lost the case. Um, the lower court uh, found, it was purely a technicality as far as Cuccinelli was concerned, that the court found that in his 40-page filing to the court, he had failed to provide evidence of uh, wrongdoing on my part. <laughs> and so they uh, rejected uh, the subpoena, which he successfully uh, appealed to the state Supreme Court, which uh, later ruled on the case, once again uh, rejecting the case with prejudice, meaning they really don't want to see an attorney general ever come back to the court with something like this again. Um, and Ken Cuccinelli uh, lost out in his effort to uh, attack uh, me and my fellow scientists. Uh, he ran for governor uh, in the last uh, Virginia governor's race. Um, I campaigned actively for his opponent, uh, Terry McAuliffe, who was uh, victorious. And uh, Ken Cuccinelli now, well, he's... Um, He's actually running an oyster farm on an island, Tangier Island, that is in the Chesapeake Bay off the coast of Virginia. It's an island that is slowly succumbing to the effects of sea level rise and will uh, disappear uh, decades from now. And I'm not making this up. <laughs> you can check it out. That's what Ken Cuccinelli is up to now. Apparently, he hasn't learned his lesson. Well, nor have congressional Republicans who continue to this day, uh, the House uh, Science Committee Chair, Lamar Smith, the chair of the House Science Committee, that was Sherwood Bollert was the chair of the House Science Committee um, who came to our defense when we were attacked by Joe Barton. His counterpart today, Lamar Smith, is really an equal opportunity denier. He denies all science. He denies climate change. He denies uh, the effects of tobacco. He denies evolution really an equal opportunity denier. Um, also, of course, heavily funded by fossil fuel interests. Um, 
And uh, he has basically done everything he can to defund scientific funding for climate science in the United States through our National Science Foundation, through the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, through NASA. Um, he has issued subpoenas against scientists demanding their personal emails sound uh, familiar. I wrote an op-ed that you can check out in the New York Times about uh, this latest assault on climate science. Uh, apparently, some Republicans haven't learned the lesson. Uh, but some have. Folks like uh, Sherwood Bullard, who I consider a, a true American hero, has spoken out frequently about the danger posed to his party, the party that he loves, the Republican Party, by the actions of his colleagues who continue to engage in assaults on scientists. And he has warned his party that if they continue to go down this road, they will forever be known as the party of anti-science. And there are conservative Republicans like uh, Bob Inglis, who uh, was a conservative Republican. He's also a very good friend. Politi uh, Politics-wise, I don't think he and I agree on very much. <laughs> um, uh, he was, had an almost perfect conservative voting record in the House of Representatives, but he made one mistake. He spoke out on the House floor on the importance of doing something about climate change. He's an evangelical Christian. He feels it is our duty to preserve creation for future generations. And he warned his fellow Republicans that they need to get on board. They need to stop rejecting the science and get on board with helping solve this problem. And for that, um, he lost his congressional seat. Um, he was challenged by um, a, uh, he faced a primary challenge, another Republican uh, challenging him for his seat, which is rare for an incumbent Republican. Um, uh, his, uh, his opponent was heavily funded by the Koch brothers. Um, and uh, Bob Inglis was defeated. In fact, he only got 25% of the vote after having gotten 75% of the vote in his district when he was elected. So what's he doing now? He's traveling around the country, uh, speaking to conservatives about how they need to get on board, about doing something about climate change. There's a worthy debate to be had about how we solve this problem. And if conservatives want to be at the table, uh, they have to get on board with the science. And then uh, they have a rightful place at the table in discussing how we go about solving this problem. And he has his own thoughts about free market approaches, conservative approaches to dealing with the climate change problem. But there are still some other Republicans. Um, in fact, one who uh, will be the nominee of their party for the presidential election, who have made it very clear where they stand on the science of climate change and many other matters. Um, and so we face an historic election. Um, in November in the United States, uh, the results of this presidential election, and I don't think I'm exaggerating, saying that the fate of the planet, to some extent, may lie in the results of this presidential election. And I've urged uh, and will continue to urge my fellow uh, Americans to make sure to vote in this next election because the, the earth literally does um, hang in the balance. Finally, let me leave this on a personal note because too often I think we frame the issue of climate change entirely in terms of science, or economics, cost-benefit analysis, um, policy, or politics. To me, more than anything else, it's a problem of ethics, of intergenerational ethics. What sort of world do we want to leave be, uh, behind for our children and grandchildren? Now, this is a photo of my daughter, and that is a polar bear. Um, and I promise we're not torturing our daughter here in this picture. Uh, um, uh, in the Pittsburgh Zoo, you can uh, go through this plexiglass tunnel underneath the polar bear feeding pool. And if you happen to be involved in a National Science Foundation funded project to develop climate change outreach materials for zoos and aquaria around the country, and you know the manager of the Pittsburgh Zoo, you can probably convince him to throw the fish in the pool when your daughter is walking underneath <laughs> the tunnel, which is what's happening here. But on a serious note, uh, I would hate to think that you know, my daughter uh, will have to return to this zoo decades from now with her children, maybe her grandchildren, and, and talk about how these magnificent creatures used to live in the wild, but we literally melted their home. We destroyed their home. And that is a possible future, but that doesn't have to be our future. And uh, the, the, the real point here is there is still time for us to control our destiny, to make sure that we do not leave behind a degraded planet for our children and grandchildren. Thank you.